you're one of the one of the only people who dared boldly <laughs> to try to formalize our, the idea of artificial general intelligence to to have a um a mathematical framework for intelligence just like as we mentioned termed aixi a i x i so let me ask the basic question uh what is aixi okay so let me first say what it stands for because what it stands for actually that's probably the more basic question yeah. what it <laughs> <laughs> the first question is usually how how it's pronounced but finally i put it on the website how it's pronounced yeah. so people <laughs> and you figured it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the name comes from ai artificial intelligence and the x i is the greek letter xi which are used for solomonov's distribution for quite stupid reasons which I'm not willing to repeat here in front sure. of camera. <laughs> <laughs> so it just happened to be uh, you know, more or less arbitrary. I chose this Xi, yeah. um, but it also has nice um, other interpretations. So um, there are actions and perceptions in this model, right? An agent has actions and perceptions and over time. So this is A index I, X index I. So there's the action at time I and then followed by perception. <laughs> At time I, yeah, um, we'll go with that. I'll edit out the first part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have some more interpretations. Yeah. So uh, at some point, maybe five years ago or ten years ago, I discovered in uh, in Barcelona, it was on a big church. Uh, there was in you know in stone engraved some text, and the word Ixi appeared there <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised and and uh, and and happy about that and i looked it up so it is a catalan language and it means with some interpretation of that's it that's the right thing to do yeah heurica oh so it's almost like destined uh somehow came yeah came, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, came to you in a dream so okay. similar there's a chinese word aixi also written like aixi if you transcribe it to pinyin yeah. and the final one is that is ai Mm -hmm. crossed with induction because that is and that's going more to the content now um, so good old-fashioned AI is more about you know planning and known deterministic world and induction is more about often you know IID data and inferring models and essentially what this IXE model does is combining these two and uh, I actually also recently I think heard that in Japanese AI means love so oh. <laughs> so if you can combine <laughs> XI somehow with that I think we can uh <laughs> there might be some interesting ideas there. So I see, let's then take the next step. Can you maybe um, talk at the big level of what is this mathematical framework? Yeah, so it consists essentially of two parts. One is the learning and induction and prediction part. And the other one is the planning part. So let's come first to the learning, induction, prediction part, which essentially I explained already before. So. Um, what we need for any agent to act well is that it can somehow predict what happens. I mean, if you have no idea what your actions do, um, how can you decide which actions are good or not? So you need to have some model of what your actions affect. So what you do is you have some experience, you build models like scientists, you know, of your experience, then you hope these models are roughly correct, and then you use these models for prediction. And the model is, sorry to interrupt, and the model is based on the, your perception of the world, how your actions will affect that world. That's not, um, so what, it, it, how do you think that's about not the model? important part, but it is technically important, but at this stage, we can just think about predicting, say, uh, stock market data, weather data, or, or IQ sequences, one, two, three, four, five, what comes next, yeah? So, um, of course, our actions affect what we're doing, but I come back to that in a second. So, so and I'll keep just interrupting. So, uh, just to, to draw a line between prediction and planning, well, what do you mean by prediction in this in this way it's trying to predict the the environment without your long-term action in the environment what is prediction okay if you want to put the actions in now okay then let's put in now yeah um so uh, we don't have yeah, to put them now yeah, yeah. So, scratch it <laughs> scratch it dumb so, question okay, okay. so <laughs> the, the simplest form of prediction is that you just have data which you passively observe yes and you want to predict what happens without you know interfering as I said, weather forecasting, stock market, uh, IQ sequences, or uh, just anything, okay? And Solomonov's theory of induction based on compression. So you look for the shortest program, which describes your data sequence. And then you take this program, run it, 
it reproduces your data sequence by definition, and then you let it continue running, and then it will produce some predictions. And you can rigorously prove that for any prediction task, this is essentially the best possible predictor. Of course, if there's a prediction task um, or a task which is unpredictable, like, you know, you have fair coin flips. Yeah, I cannot predict the next fair coin flip. What Solomonov does is says, okay, next head is probably 50%. It's the best you can do. So if something is unpredictable, Solomonov will also not magically predict it. But if there is some pattern and predictability, then Solomonov induction will figure that out eventually, and not just eventually, but rather quickly, and you can have proof convergence rates, um, whatever your data is. So that is pure magic in a sense. Um, what's the catch? Well, the catch is that it's not computable, and we come back to that later. You cannot just implement it, you know, even with Google resources here, yeah, and run it and you know predict the stock market and become rich. I mean, if, <laughs> Ray Solomonov already you know, tried it at the time. Um, <laughs> but the, so the, the, the basic task is you're in, you're in the environment, and you're interacting with the environment to try to learn a model of that environment. And the model is in the space of these all these programs. And your goal is to get a bunch of programs that are simple. Yeah, so let's uh, let's go to the actions now. But actually good that you asked. Usually I skip this part, although that is also a minor contribution, which I did, so the action part. But I usually sort of just jump to the decision part. So let me explain to the action part now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. Yes. Um, so you have to modify it a little bit by now not just predicting a sequence which just comes to you, but you have an observation, then you act somehow, and then you want to predict the next observation based on the past observation and your action. Then you take the next action. You don't care about predicting it because you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then you get the next observation and you want, well, before you get it, you want to predict it again based on your past action and observation sequence. You just condition extra on your actions. There's an interesting alternative that you also try to predict your own actions. Um, if you want- oh, In the past or the future? In what the, the, your future actions. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, let me wrap. I think my brain just broke. Um, we should maybe discuss that later after I've explained the IXC model. That's an interesting variation. But that's, that is a really interesting variation. And, and a quick comment, I don't know if you want to insert that in here, but uh, you're looking at the, in terms of observations, you're looking at the entire, the big history, the long history of the observations. Exactly, that's very important, the whole history from birth sort of of the agent. And we can come back to that. Um, also why this is important, yeah. Often, you know, in RL, you have MDPs, uh, macro decision processes, which are much more limiting. Okay, so now we can predict conditioned on actions. So even if we influence the environment, but prediction is not all we want to do, right? We also want to act really in the world. And the question is how to choose the actions. And we don't want to greedily choose the actions, um, you know, just, you know, what is best in, in the next time step. I and mean, first I should say, you know, what is, you know, how do we measure performance? So we measure performance by giving the agent reward. Uh, that's the so-called reinforcement learning framework. So every time step, you can give it a positive reward or negative reward, or maybe no reward. It could be a very scarce, right? Like if you play chess, just at the end of the game, you give plus one for winning or minus one for losing. So in the IXC framework, that's completely sufficient. So occasionally you give a reward signal and you ask the agent to maximize reward, but not greedily sort of, you know, the next one, next one, because that's very bad in the long run if you're greedy. Um, so, but over the lifetime of the agent. So let's assume the agent lives for M time steps, let's say it dies in sort of 100 years sharp. That's just, you know, the simplest model to explain. Mm -hmm. So it looks at the future reward sum and asks, what is my action sequence? Or actually more precisely my policy, which leads in expectation, because I don't know the world, um, to the maximum reward sum. Let me give you an analogy. Um, in chess, for instance, um, we know how to play optimally in theory. It's just a mini-max strategy. I play the move which seems best to me under the assumption that the opponent plays the move which is best for him, so best, so worst for me, under the assumption that he, uh, I play, again, the best move. And then you have this expected max tree to the end of the game. And then you back propagate and then you get the best possible move. So that is the optimal strategy, which von Neumann already figured out a long time ago um, um, for playing adversarial games. Luckily, or maybe unluckily for the theory, it becomes harder. The world is not always adversarial. Um, so it can be 
if there are other humans, even cooperative, yeah, or nature is usually, I mean, the dead nature is stochastic, you know, you know things just happen randomly, um, or I don't care about you. So what you have to take into account is the noise, yeah, and not necessarily the reality. So you replace the minimum on the opponent's side by an expectation, which is general enough to include also adversarial uh, cases. So now instead of a minimax strategy, you have an expected max strategy. So far, so good. So that is well known. It's called sequential decision theory. But the question is, on which probability distribution do you base that? If I have the true probability distribution, like say I play backgammon, right? There's dice and there's certain randomness involved. Yeah, I can calculate probabilities and feed it in the expected max or the sequential decision tree, come up with the optimal decision if I have enough compute. Mm -hmm. But in the, for the real world, we don't know that, you know, what is the probability that the driver in front of me breaks? I don't know. Yeah, so it depends on all kinds of things and especially new situations, I don't know. So this is this unknown thing about prediction and there's where Solomonov comes in. So what you do is in sequential decision tree, you just replace the true distribution, which we don't know, by this universal distribution. I didn't explicitly talk about it, but this is used for universal prediction and plug it into the sequential decision tree mechanism. And then you get the best of both worlds. You have a long-term planning agent, but it doesn't need to know anything about the world because the Solomon reduction part learns. Can you uh, explicitly try to describe uh, the universal distribution and how Solomon induction plays a role here? Yes, I'm trying so, to understand. So what it does it, um, so in the simplest case, I said, take the shortest program describing your data, run it, have a prediction which would be deterministic. Yes. Okay. Um, but you should not just take the shortest program, but also consider the longer ones, mm -hmm. but keep it lower a priori probability. So in the Bayesian framework, you say um, a priori, any distribution, um, which is a model um, or a stochastic program has a certain a priori probability, which is two to the minus and why two to the minus length, you know, I could explain length of this program. So longer programs are punished, yeah, a priori. And then you multiply it with the so-called likelihood function, yeah, which is, as the name suggests, is how likely is this model given the data at hand. Uh, yeah. So if you have a very wrong model, it's very unlikely that this model is true. And so it is very small number. So even if the model is simple, it gets penalized by that. And what you do is then you take just the sum, but this is the average over it. And this gives you a probability distribution. So, so called universal distribution or Solomonov distribution. So it's weighed by the simplicity of the program and the likelihood. Yes. It's kind of a nice idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, and then uh, you said there's, you're planning N or M or forgot the letter steps into the future. So how difficult is that problem? What's involved there? Okay. It's so a basic are, optimization problem. What are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, so you have a, a planning problem up to horizon M, and that's exponential time in, in the horizon M, which is, I mean, it's computable, but intractable. I mean, even for chess, it's already intractable to do that exactly and, you know, for Go. But it could be also discounted kind of framework where. Yeah, so, so having a hard horizon, you know, at 100 years, it's just for simplicity of discussing the model, and also sometimes the math is simple. Um, but there are lots of variations. It's actually a quite interesting parameter. It's, it's, there's nothing really problematic about it, but it's very interesting. So for instance, you think, no, let's, let's, tend, let's let the parameter M tend to infinity, right? You want an agent which lives forever, right? If you do it naively, you have two problems. First, the mathematics breaks down because you have an infinite reward sum which may give infinity and getting reward 0 0.1 every time step is infinity and giving reward one every time step is infinity. So equally good, mm -hmm. not really what we want. Other problem is that um, if you have an infinite life, you can be lazy for as long as you want for 10 years yeah. and then catch up with the same expected reward. And, you know, think about yourself or, you know, or maybe, you know, some friends or so, um, if they knew they lived forever, you know, why work hard now? You know, just enjoy your life, you know, and then catch up later. So that's another problem with the infinite horizon. And you mentioned, yes, we can go to discounting, but then the standard discounting is so-called geometric discounting. So a dollar today is about worth as much as, you know, $1.05 tomorrow. 
So if you do this so-called geometric discounting, you have introduced an effective horizon. So um, the agent is now motivated to look ahead a certain amount of time effectively. It's like a moving horizon. And for any fixed effective horizon, there is a problem to solve, which requires larger horizons. So if I look ahead, you know, five time steps, I'm a terrible chess player, right? Um, I need to look ahead longer. If I play Go, I probably have to look ahead even longer. So for every problem, um, no, for every horizon, there is a problem which this horizon cannot solve. Yes. But I introduced the so-called near harmonic horizon, which goes down with one over T rather than exponentially in T, which produces an agent which effectively looks into the future proportional to each age. So if it's five years old, it plans for five years. If it's 100 years old, it then plans for 100 years. Interesting. And it's a little bit similar to humans too, right? I mean, children don't plan ahead very long, but when we get adult, we play ahead more longer. Maybe when we get old, very old, I mean, we know that we don't live forever, and you know, maybe then our horizon shrinks again. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, oh, that, so that's really interesting. So adjust, adjusting the horizon, what, uh, is there some mathematical benefit of that? Of Or is it just a nice, uh, I mean, intuitively, empirically, it would probably be a good idea to sort of push the horizon back to uh, extend the horizon as you experience more of the world. But is there some mathematical conclusions here that are beneficial? With Solomon of Induction, sort of prediction part, we have extremely strong finite time, um, but no, finite data results. So you have so and so much data, then you lose so and so much. So, so the deterioration is really great. With the IXC model, with the planning part, Many results are only asymptotic, um, which, well, this is... Uh, what is asymptotic Asymptotic mean? means you can prove, for instance, that in the long run, if the agent, you know, acts long enough, then, you know, it performs optimal or some nice thing happens. So, but you don't know how fast it converges. Yeah. So it may converge fast, but we're just not able to prove it because it's a difficult problem. Or maybe there's a bug um, in the in the, in the the model so that it's really that slow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that is what asymptotic means, sort of eventually, but we don't know how fast. And if I give the agent a fixed horizon M, yeah, then I cannot prove asymptotic results, right? So I mean, sort of if it dies in 100 years, then in 100 years is over, I cannot say eventually. So this is the advantage of the discounting that I can prove asymptotic results. So just to clarify, so so I, okay, I made, I built up a model, well, now in the moment, of uh, have this way of looking st several steps ahead. How do I pick what action I will take? It's like with a playing chess, right? You do this mini max. In this case, here do expect the max based on the Solomonov distribution. Um, you propagate back, um, and then, well, an action falls out. Mm -hmm. The action which maximizes the future expected reward under Solomonov's distribution, and then you just take this action. And then repeat. And then you get a new observation, and you yeah. feed it in this action and observation, yeah. and then you repeat. And the reward, so on. Yeah, so you reward too, yeah. And then maybe you can even predict your own action. I love that idea. But okay, this big framework, what is it? Uh, is, is I mean, uh, it's kind of a beautiful mathematical framework to think about artificial general intelligence. What can you, what does it help you intuit about um, how, how to build such systems? Or maybe from another perspective, what, <laughs> how, what does it help us to in understanding uh, AGI? So when I started in the field, I was always interested in two things. One was, you know, AGI, um, the name didn't exist then, what's it called general AI or um, strong AI. Um, and the physics theory of everything. So I switched back and forth between computer science and physics quite often. Uh, you said the theory of everything. The theory of everything, yeah, just like. Yeah. Those are basically the two theory. biggest problems before all, all of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> you don't... Yeah, I can explain if you wanted some later time, you know, why I'm interested in these two questions. Can I ask you on a yeah. small tangent, if, if, uh, if one to be, it was one to be solved, which one would you? If one, if you were, if an apple fell in your head and there was a brilliant insight and you could arrive at the solution to one, would it be AGI or the theory of everything? Uh, definitely AGI, because once the AGI problem is solved, I can ask the AGI to solve the other problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliantly put. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, so as you were saying about it. Okay, so, and the reason why I didn't settle, I mean, this thought about, you know, 
once you have solved AGI, it solves all kinds of other, not just the theory of every problem, but all kinds of use, more useful problems to humanity is very appealing to many uh, people. And, you know, I had this thought also, but um, I was quite disappointed with the state of the art of the field of AI. There was some theory, you know, about logical reasoning, but I was never convinced that this will fly. And then there was this more, more heuristic approaches with neural networks, and I didn't like these heuristics. So, and also I didn't have any good idea myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason why I toggled back and forth quite some while and even worked so four and a half years in, in a company developing software, something completely unrelated. But then I had this idea about the IXE model. And um, so what it gives you, it gives you a gold standard. So I have proven that this is the most intelligent agents which anybody could Built, built in quotation mark, yeah, because it's just mathematical and you need infinite compute. Yeah, but this is the limit, and this is completely specified. It's not just a framework, and mm -hmm. you know, every year tens of frameworks are developed, um, which just cut skeletons, and then pieces are missing, and usually these missing pieces, you know, turn out to be really, really difficult. And so this is completely and uniquely defined, and we can analyze that mathematically, and. Um, we've also developed some approximations. I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, that would be sort of the top-down approach, like say for Neumann's Minimax theory, that's the theoretical optimal play of games. And now we need to approximate it, put heuristics in, prune the tree, blah, 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 and so on. So we can do that also with the IXE model, but for general AI. Um, it can also inspire those, and most of most researchers go bottom up, right? They have the systems that try to make it more general, more intelligent. It can inspire in which direction to go. Uh, what do you mean by that? So if you have some choice to make, right? So how should I evaluate my system if I can't do cross-validation? Um, how should I do um, my learning if my standard regularization doesn't work well? Yeah. So the answer is always this. We have a system which does everything. That's IXE. It's just, you know, completely in the ivory tower, completely useless from a practical point of view. But you can look at it and see, ah, yeah, maybe, you know, I can take some aspects and, you know, instead of Kolmogorov complexity, they just take some compressors, which has been developed so far. Okay. Uh, and for the planning, well, we have UCT, which has also, you know, been used in Go. Um, and um, it, I, at least it's inspired me a lot um, to have this formal um, definition. And if you look at other fields, you know, like I always come back to physics because I have a physics background. Think about the phenomenon of energy. That was long time a mysterious concept. And at some point it was completely formalized. Um, and that really helped a lot. And you, you can point out a lot of these um, things which were first mysterious and vague, and then they have been rigorously formalized. Speed and acceleration has been confused, right? Until it was formally defined. Yeah, there was a time like this. And, and people, you know, often, you know, who oh, don't have any background, you know, still confuse it. Um, so, and this IXE model or the, the intelligence definitions, which is sort of the dual to it, we come back to that later, formalizes the notion of intelligence uniquely and rigorously. So in, in a sense, it serves as kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. So yes, for, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's a million questions I, I could ask her. So maybe um, kind of, okay, let's feel around in the dark a little bit. So uh, there's been here at DeepMind, but in general, been a lot of breakthrough ideas, just like we've been saying around reinforcement learning. So how do you see the progress in reinforcement learning is different? Like which subset of IXE does it occupy? The current, like you said, uh, the maybe the Markov assumption is made quite often in reinforcement learning. The There's, there's other assumptions made in order to make the system work. What do you see as the difference connection between reinforcement learning and IXE? Yeah, so the major difference is that um, essentially all other approaches, they make stronger assumptions. So in reinforcement learning, the Markov assumption is that uh, the, the next state or next observation only depends on the, on the previous observation and not the whole history, which makes, of course, the mathematics much easier right, rather than dealing with histories. Um, of course, they profit from it also because then you have algorithms that run on current computers and do something practically useful. But um, for general AI, all the assumptions which are made by other approaches, we know already now they are limiting. So, um, for instance, 
usually you need an ergodicity assumption in the MDP frameworks in order to learn. Ergodicity essentially means that you can recover from your mistakes and that there are no traps in the environment. And if you make this assumption, then essentially you can, you know, go back to a previous state, go there a couple of times and then learn what, um, what statistics um, and what the state is like, and then in the long run perform well in this state. Yeah, but there are no fundamental problems. But in real life, we know, you know, there can be one single action, you know, one second of being inattentive while driving a car fast, you know, yeah. can ruin the rest of my life. I can become quadriplegic or whatever. So, and there's no recovery anymore. So the real world is not ergodic, I always say, you know, there are traps and there are situations where you're not recovered from. And um, very little theory has been developed for this case. What about, uh, what do you see in the, in the context of IEC as the role of exploration? Sort of, um, you, you mentioned, you know, in the, in the real world we can get into trouble when we make the wrong decisions and really pay for it. But exploration is, seems to be fundamentally important for learning about this world, for gaining new knowledge. So is it is exploration baked in? Another way to ask it, what are the parameters of this, uh, of IXC that can be controlled? Yeah, I say the good thing is that there are no parameters to control. Um, some other people try knobs to, to control and you, you can do that. I mean, you can modify IXC so that you have some knobs to play with if you want to. Um, but the exploration is directly baked in and that comes from uh, the Bayesian learning and the long-term planning. So these together um, already imply um, exploration. You can nicely and explicitly prove that for uh, simple problems like so-called uh, bandit problems, um, where um, you say, to give a real world example, say you have two medical treatments, A and B, you don't know the effectiveness, you try A a little bit, B a little bit, but you don't want to harm too many patients. So you have to sort of um, trade off exploring. Yeah. And at some point you want to explore and uh, you can do the mathematics and figure out the optimal strategy. Um, um, the so-called Bayesian agents, they're also non-Bayesian agents. Um, but it shows that um, this Bayesian framework by taking a prior over possible worlds, um, doing the Bayesian mixture, then the base optimal decision with long-term planning that is important, um, automatically um, implies exploration also to the proper extent, not too much exploration and not too little in these very simple settings. In the IXC model, I was also able to prove that it is a self-optimizing theorem or asymptotic optimality theorems, although they're only asymptotic, not finite time bounds. So it seems like the long-term planning is a really important, but the long-term part of the planning is really important. Yes. And also, I mean, maybe a, a quick tangent, how important do you think is uh, removing the Markov assumption and looking at the full history? Sort of intuitively, of course, it's important, but is it like fundamentally transformative to the entirety of the problem? What's your sense of it? Like, cause we all, we make that assumption quite often. It's just throwing away yeah. the past. No, I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, the question is whether there's a way to deal with it in a more heuristic and still sufficiently well way. So um, now I have to come up with an example and fly, but you know, you have say, some, you know, key event in your life, you know, a long time ago, you know, in some city or something, you realized, you know, that's a really dangerous street or whatever, right? Yeah. And you want to remember that forever, right? Um, in case you come back there. Kind of a, a selective kind of memory. So you remember the, all the important events in the past, but somehow selecting the importance is- that, That's very hard, yeah? yeah. And I'm not concerned about, you know, just storing the whole history. It's just, you can calculate, um, you know, human life says 30 or 100 years, doesn't matter, right? Um, uh, how much uh, data comes in through the vision system and the auditory system. You compress it a little bit, um, in this case, lossily, and store it. Um, we are soon in the means of just storing it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But um, you still need to the selection um, for the planning part and the compression for the understanding part. The raw storage, I'm really not concerned about. Um, and I think we should just store, if we develop an agent, um, pr preferably just, just store all the interaction history and then um, you build, of course, models on top of it and you compress it um, and you are selective, but occasionally 
you go back to the old data and reanalyze it um, based on your new experience you have. You know, sometimes you you are in school, you learn all these things you think is totally useless, and you know, much later you realize, oh, they were not, you know, <laughs> so useless as you thought. <laughs>